is our first opportunity to worship together in the year 2009. Do you find it hard to believe that it's 2009? All of you tell me life goes faster and faster the older you get. I can't believe that it could go any faster than it already is moving. <coughs> These first few weeks of January are typically a time for us to look back over 2008, to consider where we've been. Even more so, the dawning days of a new year are a time in which many of us will set resolutions to dream about what this new year will be. This past week, I was blessed to be able to spend some time in the Florida Keys with my grandparents. Usually, we only have two or three days there, and our visits are usually a whirlwind. You all perhaps know something of the whirlwind that holidays can be. This year, though, we managed to have a full week in Florida. And so I was able to squeeze in a few moments to reflect. Like many of you in the days of the new year, I pondered last year and thought of the year to come. But mostly I gave my attention to the natural world around me. There were pelicans in the treetops. There was that odor of day-old fish. There was sand so soft it felt like it must have been made in a silk factory, not by God's own natural hand. But the most spectacular thing I saw is something that I could see and you could see right here in Frederick, but we rarely do. In the Keys, miles away from any big cities and eons away from my hustled life, I sat back in a chair, looked up in the sky, and was surprised. There are still <coughs> stars. Stars so bright I did not need a flashlight. Stars so numerous I could have not counted them if I stayed up till dawn. I don't think I've ever realized there were so many stars. But there they were, beaming in the night. And as I gazed into those starlit heavens, I found myself reconnecting with the maker of stars. My anxiety over things not accomplished in 08 and my fear over what will be in the coming year dissipated like haze as the stars shone upon me. I went on walks each night after I tucked the boys into bed, mostly to go to the bathroom to brush my teeth, but even more so to look at the stars. I would talk to God as if it were his eyes I was gazing into rather than his galaxies. Have you noticed the stars lately? The stars are gorgeous reminders of who we are and the God that is always looking down upon us. This morning as we embark upon a new year, I want to share with you a few timeless truths, more ancient even than the stars of night. These ancient truths speak of God's eternal plan for us, God's people. Our scriptures, like stars in the sky, illuminate a brilliant plan which God has set in motion since the creation of the world. A plan for God to be our God and us to be God's people. <clears throat> a plan in which God reveals his glory and grace to us and adopts us as beloved children. It is my prayer that in these brief moments that God's presence will permeate our lives for this new year. That as we reflect upon God's scriptures, that some of the haze of daily life will drift away, and that we will each find ourselves more steadily in God's hand. That we will see more clearly that God has a plan for this and every year. As this is the beginning of a new year, we start in just the right place in our scriptures today. In Genesis 1, we hear it read, In the beginning, God. Usually we rush ahead to the next verse, but let's stop there. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, there was only one thing that mattered. God. And it was by God's initiative that everything we know, everything we see, everything we hold, even our own selves, were brought into being. As it is written in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the water, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. 
And God said, let us make humankind in our image, and there were human ones. The Gospel of John, Jackie's favorite text, is found in our New Testament, yet it has a familiar start. It's somewhat surprising because we would expect a gospel, a gospel is the story of the life of Christ, to begin at the nativity scene, right? At Christmas, like Luke or Matthew. We might expect John to begin his story in the stable, but John begins the story of Christ's life eons earlier, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Through him all things were made. In him was life, and that was the light of all men. The Gospel writer, John, who is believed to be a close acquaintance with Jesus, the gospel writer is convinced that Jesus did not begin in a stable, but the word who became flesh at Christmas was present with God at creation. This revelation is important for us to understand in order to grasp the nature of Jesus and in order for us to see God's plan for our salvation as eternal. Let's look back again at the opening lines of Genesis. As you hear me read them, I want you to hear and think, where is God the Father in this? Where is God the Spirit? And where is God the Word, or Jesus? See if you can pick them each out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, for the earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the waters, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Right here in the first three verses of Genesis, we find the entirety of our Christian trinity. The Father, the Father is that creative instinct, the longing to be known. In the beginning when there was nothing, God, God the Father was there longing to be known. Did you spot the spirit? Where was the spirit? Hovering. hovering. Isn't that beautiful? The spirit of God was hovering over the <coughs> chaos. Those of us that have known some chaos are comforted to know that the spirit hovers even in chaos. The spirit of God hovered over the formless void, it was eager to bring something new and beautiful into existence. But where is the word? Where is Jesus in that first line of Genesis? Light. Light? You can say light. You can also say word. When one speaks, what comes forth from our lips? Word. Words. You know my thoughts and my heart this morning because the word, the thought, that is in my heart is communicated to you through the words that you hear with your ears. And then your brain decides whether you will receive my word as your own, whether you will ponder it for a while to decide if you agree, or whether you will reject it entirely. My word is my gift, my self-expression to you, so that you know what I wish to communicate, so that you know my love, or you know my disappointment, or you know my fears or my longings. When God said, let there be light, God breathed out God's spirit. And that spirit carried God's creative word into the darkness. And when God's creative word touched the chaos, there was light, and there was beauty, and there was order. When that creative word touched the darkness, there was light. I love the movies that take you from the chaotic darkness prior to creation, and then suddenly there's an abundance of light and life, and you see dolphins and sea turtles and vines growing and human ones in the garden. The word is God's self-expressive force through which the all-powerful and glorious God gets involved in the stuff of earth. Through the word, God plays in the dirt of the garden. God brings light in our darkness. God separates the water and brings land. And God puts the walruses and the sea and the stars in the sky 